The following podcast is a proud member of the Blue Collar Roots Network. Find all the shows by visiting bluecollarroots.com. He may seem like a mild-mannered engineer until you install an HVAC system improperly. Then the whole turning green Hulk shirt ripping thing happens. And it's not pretty. Here's Bill Spone. Welcome back to the Building HVAC Science Podcast, where it's our goal to help create better, more knowledgeable HVAC and building performance technicians by helping the two professions to better understand each other with the ultimate goal of making customers happy in the homes they live in and the buildings they work in. In today's episode, I chat with James Childry, founder of Redpoint Montana, a home performance specialist. James will share with us his enthusiasm for the field and describes his unique, somewhat persuasive persistence in preaching home performance, that's a lot of P's right there, in his role as a home energy rater and a home inspector. He discusses this approach with contractors and consumers as well as where he looks for improving what he's doing in the trade and improving the trade overall. We'll explore the topic of making change and not losing faith in spite of the apparent slow movement in the industry of home performance. Okay, let's listen up to what James has to say in this enjoyable conversation we have. James, how are you doing this morning? Doing great, Bill. Thanks for having me. So James, where do we first meet? So Habitat X, I want to say two years ago, I was invited by Chris Dorsey, who you just had on your podcast, and was sort of there as much as an observer and as much as a participant. So I think we met there. And I've described Habitat X to my listeners before. Why don't you give me your take on what is Habitat X? Well, I wasn't sure what it was either, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I had wandered into Montana and was looking for a new career path and somehow stumbled upon Chris and had uh, coffee with him. And he said, well, man, if you're into home performance, you got to come to Habitat X. And Chris, in his way, convinced me that it was worth going to. And even though I was just starting a business, sounded like something I needed to be part of. So I went and checked it out. It was very different than other conferences I had been to. And what I really enjoyed about it was there were people from all different parts of the industry and everybody was treated equally, allowed to have a voice. Here I was coming in with more field type experience and talking to the guy who started ResNet and guys who are running big energy programs in California. And we are all able to have this really productive conversation that that was meaningful to me anyway. That's very cool. It's a very good way of putting it there. So you said you're just coming to Montana. What's sort of your history that's brought to you to Montana and in the home performance industry up to now? I have a degree in international finance and was a banker and decided that banking wasn't for me. And at the same time, my father-in-law had started a home inspection business in Florida. And I really didn't want to live in Florida, but my wife and I just had our first baby and she didn't really want to go back to work. And so we moved down to Florida. I quit banking. I started working with my father-in-law and bought the business from him about a year later and operated that business for about 10 years before I had had enough of the swamp and I needed a change. So the little detour, we sold everything that we owned, the business, the car, the house, everything except what would fit in one duffel bag. By this time, I had three kids and we took a trip around the world. So I spent eight months traveling from Florida to Europe, down to Africa, through Southeast Asia, Australia. And then we, somewhere in Vietnam, we kind of decided that we needed to land somewhere and started looking around. And I think there was an outside magazine article about Montana. We're like, well, we hadn't lived there yet. Let's try that out. So we Flew into LA, flew to Bozeman, drove through downtown, went up to the ski resort and said, this is it. Now I just got to figure out what I'm going to do with myself. I, I still didn't have a plan, but I had been a home inspector for 10 years. I did have that to fall back on, but I didn't really want to do that. I actually bought a spray foam rig and did industrial coatings and spray foam for about six months before I decided, well, maybe that home inspection thing wasn't so bad. If you've ever had to do insulation, you know that it's not a fun job. During that process, I had received my HERS rating certification and I had a blower door set up, duct testing set up, thermal imaging I'd been doing for 10 years. So I kind of jumped back into the inspection and diagnostic part of the world. So that's what I do now. Do you own your own business there? I do. Yeah. So Redpoint is the name of my company and it's a bit amorphous probably because that's sort of how my business has evolved several times just in the last three years that I've been here. Redpoint is a climbing term that basically says you come to the bottom of a climb with previous experience and you're able to get from the bottom to the top in a single go. And that sort of encompassed what I 
wanted to do with my business. I come in with previous experience. Uh, I come and I do the job right the first time. So if you've got a good tagline that I could use, I would be happy to take it because so far, if you're a climber, you get it. And if you're not a climber, you're like, what does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I see awesome uh, visions in my mind for a logo. And honestly, I've never looked at your website or your logo, your card, That there's probably a lot you could play with there with the color red and the point, the kind of the apex and things like that. Exactly. Yeah. So we met at uh, Habitat X, seen each other a couple of years, not in a row, but a couple of years with us a year in between. And we were talking the other day about where things are in the home performance world versus where they should be. And that was sort of the conversation that framed us getting together to talk here today. And I want to get your views on where do you think things are from a home performance perspective, but I guess locally, regionally, even nationally, if you can. Sure. Well, and I think this probably part of the conversation was sparked by the experience at Habitat X in that you go there and you speak to people who are really pushing the envelope, who've thought very deeply about the industry and where it's going. They have a lot of experience. They've seen a lot of things that have been tried and some that are successful and some that are not. And so you leave after three days with this really rich sense of understanding and excitement in the industry. Just recently, this last Habitat X, we had the guys with Pearl certification and just thought that was brilliant, bringing these invisible elements of a home, the thermal performance, efficiency of systems, bringing that into a visible space so that people can appreciate them. I, I thought that's fantastic. We've been needing that for a long time. And so we come away very excited. And then I go back home and work a day-to-day -day job and see that wait, all that exciting stuff that everybody's talking about just isn't happening. Granted, I'm in Montana. And so we're very proud of the fact that we've tried not to change anything in 100 years. There's a bumper sticker that has something to that effect. So we're not California or New York by any means. But um, that said, Bozeman is a college town. It is the most progressive place in Montana. So I always get excited about these things that I hear and read and conferences I attend. And then I come home and I see that well, we're still pretty much building things the way we did 30 years ago. And it's frustrating. It sounds frustrating. It is frustrating. What kind of common repeated, I hesitate to call them mistakes, but repeated common practice that could be elevated? What are the things that you see happening over and over again that could be upgraded? They're simple things, right? Probably the most frustrating thing on a macro level with the home performance industry is that a lot of the guys have figured this stuff out. How do you properly air seal something? How do you insulate to a proper value? How do you deliver comfort in a home through mechanical systems? And we kind of know how to do it. There certainly are things that need to be refined and improved, but a lot of the technology is available. And so when I go into a house and they haven't installed their Tyvek paper properly on the outside of a home, they're slapped improperly or the seams aren't sealed. The fact that we're using Tyvek instead of these other systems that are a little bit more robust, like the zip wall systems or even the spray applied stuff that they have out now, like EnviroDry. So air sealing is a big one and it's pretty simple. It's, it's caulk and foam and it's paying attention. The idea that if you drill it, you fill it. That's one of those things that a lot of contractors say, whether you're the plumber, the electrician or gas contractor, if you're damaging or changing the envelope, it's up to you to fix it. And it just doesn't usually happen. And it's one of those things that nobody really takes responsibility for. It's not necessarily the GC's responsibility. Well, the insulator's already insulated and the plumber, hey, I'm a plumber. And so those things sort of fall through the cracks. And then it's not until a guy like me comes along. I mean, thankfully, Bozeman and Montana now have energy code, which we did in a couple of years ago, and requiring testing. And so now a guy comes like me comes along, I do the blower door test and I say, hey, you guys are at five air changes. You need to be at four. And they're like, well, what do you mean? And so we went through that for about a year. And it took about that long to get guys in line. What is necessary? What does need to be done? And what I found was at first I was trying to educate each contractor and there's a lot of contractors, but there aren't a lot of subcontractors. There are only a handful of insulators in our community. There's only a handful of HVAC contractors. So if I could reach out them directly and say, hey guys, this is what we need to do to make sure everybody's successful. I found that to be a much more uh, expedient approach. So it sounds like you're doing training on your own. Or you just strike up a conversation or look for little windows to... Well, what happened in the beginning, for me anyway, and I don't know, I can't necessarily speak to national norms, but when January 16 is when we first adopted this idea of 
testing, duct testing and lower door testing, it was new to everybody in the community. And so everybody was sort of learning on the fly. And so as I was one of two guys in town doing it, so I would show up and the contractor would say, what's this blower door thing about? Or we would fail. And I'd say, well, your insulator forgot to do this. So he'd call his insulator up and say, hey, Joe, you were supposed to do this. And so Joe would come over and then we'd say, well, we've got to do our base plates, our top plates. Don't forget about these penetrations. And so we would just have conversations. And because there weren't a heck of a lot of guys who were doing the insulating and the HVAC work, it didn't have to have too many conversations. It's not like we had to have a symposium or a special conference in order to get everybody in the room. And it turned out that the contractors were asking those guys on the front end. And so they would refer me to do the diagnostic part of it. So I had a relationship with the HVAC contractors and insulators as well. And it's worked. Do you find yourself going back into your other careers, maybe in finance or in home inspection and in drawing from that? It sounds like you have this really calm approach to you. So as an inspector, which I still do that work as well, what I learned a long time ago was that the technical stuff was easy. You can learn that. I didn't know what a fascia board was. I didn't know what OSB stood for when I first started. But you can learn that stuff. But what you can't learn is the communication part. That takes the right person. Most inspectors are old contractors, and contractors generally have a specific view. Well, I would have built it this way, or they shouldn't have used that wall assembly, or why did they do this? And these very subjective ideas when, as an inspector, you're supposed to be very objective. Say, hey, look, this is right or it's wrong, and here's why. And that's all that I have to do. So my job was to communicate that information in a way that didn't kill the deal, didn't scare the buyers away, didn't offend the sellers, but identified problems. And so I take that same approach with the testing that I do because it usually happens at the end and the owner wants to move into his new house and the contractor wants to be done with it. And the code official just wants to sign off on it, and move on to the next permit. And then I come along and I say, you failed. You can't move in. You don't get paid. Nobody likes to see me coming. I'm not the most popular guy in the room, but what I found is most people just want answers. Like, hey, it's all right. I failed. What do I need to do to fix it? And if I can help with that, then I'm not such a bad guy after all. Are there other people doing rating and inspection and the monitoring this corrective action work like you are in your community? Yeah. So there, I can count five or six guys who are doing blower doors and duct testing for energy co-compliance. Nobody does it full time. Even though we're a booming community, it's still a fairly small community. We have about maybe 50,000 people in the city and maybe 65, 70,000 in the whole county. So even though there's a lot of permits, a lot of stuff being built, there's still not enough work to keep five or six guys busy just doing that. So everybody has their own part-time gig. I'm one of maybe five or six HERS raters in the state. And that's partially because there's just not a big market for it, honestly. Steve Baden and his team have done a lot to bring awareness to HERS ratings and to get it included in code as one of the paths for that. They certainly have done a lot of work, but in a place where primarily rural communities in Montana And we're still just kind of behind the rest of the nation from that regard. And so there is some work to be done. And unfortunately, when the tax credits ran out for contractors to receive a tax credit, if they met certain guidelines, basically if they were building to that Energy Star level, then they were eligible for a $2,000 tax credit. And I had to pay me a little bit of money to do the HERS rating. Maybe they had to spend a little bit more money to bring it up to that point, but they were able to get some money back, tax credit right off the bottom line. So that was what drove the business before, and that went away, and so did a lot of the HERS rating work. What have you done to your own personal property? What kind of systems or work you have going? Yeah, it's interesting you say that because I was actually I wanted to ask you how your project was coming along. There was a segment in the Habitat X where we're talking about the cobbler's house, right? And I know that you have a modular home that's going up and be anxious to hear about that. And then there was Kevin Brenner was building his own house in New York. And I actually just did the home inspection for Chris Dorsey and his house. He bought downtown an old 1920s little bungalow type of house. And he's got his work cut out for him in that house for sure. On our project, we're actually talking with the architect today, and we're recording this in mid-November of 2018 for anybody who listens later. And we've got the floor plan design. We've got the exterior look and the placement of the modules in the garage and things like that. And we'll be sort of digging into the walls and the loads and everything like that in the very near future across the next month or so. Excellent. I love the modular home idea. I think that 
it has to be the future of home construction, partially because for every five guys that retire, there's one guy coming into the crafts and you, know, you listen to find home building and they have their whole keep craft alive, trying to engage the younger people to come into the trades and show them that, hey, this is gratifying work. You can make money at it. You don't have to sit behind a desk or code to be successful in, in this world. And But it's an uphill battle. And I think that modular home construction just offers so many benefits. And I'm just really excited and pleased to see that you've made it part of your own home. Yeah, it was sort of a lucky find. And we feel like we're very happy with the way it's been going. The builder that uses a factory has been very aware of uh, high performance home attributes and uh, been very good at communication and very flexible. So we think we found a gem, a local gem of a builder here. And I'll say the name was EcoCraft Homes. If you want to look them up, anyone listening, EcoCraftHomes.com. It's really a sweet team they got going there. That's fantastic. Well, and I look around quite a bit. I actually, I guess to answer your earlier question, I rent a house right now. So we, unfortunately, or fortunately, because of what I do, I'm very picky and nothing that I see built is what I would want to buy. It's not the way I would build a house. And my wife is also very picky because she has certain layout requirements, has to be in a certain part of town, colors, all the rest of it. So between the two of us, we're probably the hardest people to please when it comes to purchasing a house. <laughs> so, Which if I had it my way, everybody would be that picky. When you talk about the challenges in the home performance industry nationally, one of the things that you see is that there are a lot of stakeholders and every stakeholder has their perspective on it. So for instance, getting a HERS rating on every MLS sheet. Well, as soon as you did that and you allowed people to judge two homes side by side with sort of that miles per gallon rating and allow them to at least make the decision. It doesn't have to be their driving force, but just have the information available. I think that would do a lot to steer the industry and steer the demand because most builders that I know say, hey, James, I'll build whatever is demanded. If they want net zero, I'll build net zero. If they want passive house, I'll figure how to do that. But as long as people believe that a code minimum built house gets an A plus grade when really it's just the passing grade, it's just what you need to do to not get fired, right? To pass your certificate of occupancy. There's so much more that can be done. And so you look at hers rating on an MLS, giving green lending practices, appraisals that include those home performance attributes. All of these, the mortgage companies, the appraisers, the contractors, the realtors, everybody has a stake in this. And when I think of the home performance industry, it, to me, I'm still trying to grasp what that means because I could think of it very narrowly as what I do, which is go through a home and tell people where the deficiencies are and how to make them better and test it and document that. But you have, there's so many other layers of that. And home performance really should just be part of a contractor doing a good job. I think of home performance as just a subset of contracting. It's just that, unfortunately, there have to be guys like me in order to, I don't want to say keep people honest, and, and I don't want to denigrate contractors because I think that they do a fantastic job. And it's a really hard job too. In Montana, when it's zero degrees outside and I'm watching guys trying to like shovel snow out of a crawl space so they can get the floor put down before it snows another foot, you're like, you don't get paid enough money, man. Like I'm going inside to have a hot cocoa, right? These guys do work really hard and it's kind of like herding cats, right? You've got all your subs running around. You've got a lot of demands on a lot of ends. And at the end of the day, the money's not always great, but doesn't take much to derail your bottom line. And so I know that there's a lot of contractors are risk averse for that reason. Hey, man, I'm going to put Tyvek up because that's what I've been doing for 20 years. And that's how I've been feeding my family. This new spray applied stuff. I don't know what that is, man. Yeah. I got to get new equipment. I got to get training. It creates a mess. I got to find a dealer for it. Yeah, exactly. And that's part of the reason that I like Habitat X because you do get to hear from all those different stakeholders and it gives me a new perspective and um, helps me appreciate what everybody does and how much work people put in. I mean, from you putting on this podcast and there are a handful of other guys who put up some really good shows, all of the work that's done over at Green Building Advisor, I read through that and I just, it's endless, the amount of information that's there. And so I do appreciate how much work is done. Thank you. It's really, it's a little piece of the puzzle, like you said. My vision is that consumers need to know more about what home performance is and what it means. And I've got some ideas swimming around in my head where 
I think I want to take this on with partners to do that, to make sure that everybody has this as part of their thinking. And it needs to be more of a grassroots effort, is my belief. It's going to come from a lot of small conversations with people changing their minds slowly. We're still in a really nascent period here with home performance and just have to keep the conversation going, lead by example the best you can. Well, that was one of the things that came out of one of those breakout sessions that we had at the conference that the thing that you've been saying several times since then about sneezing on a couple of people a day. I took that to heart as well. I was sitting in that session with you. And in my day-to-day job, it's easy when I'm doing the diagnostics and I'm doing the testing because that's exactly what we're talking about. But when I do home inspections, which is still over half of what I do every day, it's not really within my scope of work. I'm there to identify issues and help them understand them. Home performance, this whole other part of my brain get, has to get shut off. But I decided that that wasn't doing anybody any favors. I still have to kind of stay within the scope of work of what I'm hired to do, but I certainly sneak it in as much as possible that, hey, you know, some more insulation would help. If you air sealed this, you'd affect this. Certainly when there are mold issues, I get to talk about ventilation requirements. I can talk about how much more efficient a new furnace would be. There certainly are opportunities and I take them as much as possible. And I took it as a compliment the other day when I was talking to I always do a walkthrough at the end with my clients and tell them which kind of walk the property and show them what's wrong. And the realtor said, James, I don't think I've ever had a walkthrough where you weren't talking about insulation and the efficiency of the furnace. And I'm like, well, because it's important stuff. I took it as a compliment. I don't know whether she meant it that way, but (laughs) (laughs) part of why I do the podcast is I want people to have faith in what they're doing and to keep on doing it because it's going to be this thousands of people are going to make a difference together. And I think there's the big things that are going on are really important, but the little stuff can't be overlooked. And it's like those conversations you have on the walkthroughs. Those are very important. You're going to slowly influence things. I say, keep it going. Keep the faith. (laughs) Very good. Well, and I'm very encouraged by people have some negative things to say about millennials and the next generation. And I think that's probably have been true for every older generation talking about a younger generation since time began. But It's threatening. (laughs) It's a change. And I think that's exciting. I often think about that John Mayer song, Waiting on the World to Change. And to some sense, we're waiting on the old guard to die out. And I don't mean that in a terrible sense, but just in the sense that when I see what the next generation is coming up with, because I'm old enough to not be a millennial. I I went to school without the internet and didn't have a cell phone until I was about 25. I'm young, but I'm not that young. And so I see these guys coming up and they don't seem to have the same desires or needs that maybe the baby boomers did. They don't need the big house. They're not as concerned with having two cars and three babies and a dog and a white picket fence. And I think that they will be drivers of change in the home performance industry when they come in. And even from an affordability standpoint, like I can't afford a 3,000 square foot house. I can only afford 1,200 square feet and I'm going to make that work. And that's less to clean and less to pay for and less to fix. And I can still fit my two kids and my dog in there. There's an interesting tangent from that thought right there. There's a company called Module, M-O-D-U-L-E. Have you heard of them? Yeah, I have. They're a builder of home units that you can buy, and then they're designed so additions can be put on. Factory-built units can be added on. So you can buy, I think it's 600 square feet at a time. Yeah, and they're kind of cool because, yeah, you're like, I'm going to pick this bedroom and that kitchen, and they all kind of snap together like Legos. Yeah. I love that idea. It allows for the growth and expansion without having to move. You can stay in the same site as long as you have enough room to put the modules on and build as much as you need now and add on later as your needs change, your family, your household needs change. And that's brilliant, right? Because right now you buy a starter home, something small that's not perfect and it's inexpensive, but it gets you into the market and then you have a couple of kids and then you have to sell that house and you buy a new one and then you're there for a while and then now mom needs some help. So now I got to go buy another house that has an ADU and then... Now I'm later in my years and I'm going to sell another house and I'm going to downsize. And there's, it's a nice solution to that problem, I think. Definitely. So you're a technology guy, Bill. What do you think about all the IoT stuff that's coming up and interconnected thermostats and air purifiers and air monitors like the Fubot? There's all this technology that potentially can do all the heavy lifting for us. I think there's a lot of awareness raising that these products can do. 
it's interesting because they're sort of put out there with a faith that build it and they will come, build it and they will buy. And people are buying those monitors and those products. On one hand, being a technologist, I have to be somewhat cautious about the readings you get from them. They're not professional grade products, but they're very strong indicators of things, of changes. And many of the changes can be behavioral changes. Some of them can be whole system changes in houses, things like that. I think it's interesting to have sort of borrowed something Nate Adams said. It's having security cameras, low resolution security cameras, always watching this issue versus high resolution crime scene photos after something's happened. And by after something happened, I mean the there's some water damage or mold growth starts or somebody's got really bad allergies or there's a carbon monoxide poisoning or something and you bring in all these tools afterwards, but the trend of what's taking you to that point has been missed. So these are like security cameras for your air, security cameras for your environment. And I think that sort of fits in with this whole notion of video doorbells and things that monitor sounds and noises and actions and activities in your home. Now you can actually monitor the air quality. Yeah. And two things on that. One, as a personal story, I bought a Fubot, which is this indoor air quality monitor. It's very simple. It's very consumer friendly. It monitors carbon monoxide, PM 2.5, temperature, humidity, volatile organic compounds. When the indoor air quality goes down, it goes from blue to red or orange. So we plugged this thing in and it was sitting in our dining room and it drove my wife crazy. I had to unplug it. I, sorry, Jacques. <laughs> <laughs> Only because it did such a good job of telling her and telling us when our air quality changed that it was almost stressful because like, okay, all right, we know we're cooking or whatever, but sometimes it would be for no good reason. Or in the morning we'd wake up and it was orange and we're like, oh man, like, well, all right. We had five people and a dog breathing all night in a closed up house. Yeah carbon dioxide is going to be a little high or whatever. But it was something that, I mean, she would call me in the middle of the day. Why is this thing still red? I've had the windows open for an hour. And I'm like, all right, well, maybe we should need to take a break from all that information right now. I found a way to, to dim the LEDs on it. It's in the controls. And also you can shut it off during different periods. And I'm glad to hear you say that because I still like to collect the information, but I, like, I'm going to have to put it somewhere where she can't see it. My house isn't very big. Yeah, it can be alarming. But it's really beneficial. And the other part of that story, I suppose, or the, the broader context of being able to integrate these things is to take that information and make it actionable. That was the part that it's one thing to know, oh man, the thing turned red, FUBOT's mad, what do we do about it? And being able to say, integrate that into your B thermostat that's going to turn on just the fan portion of your handler to help move some air around, to help dilute it. Maybe it's connected to your... HRV, and that's going to bring some fresh air into the house when necessary. Because as you know, as hard as we try to build a quality home, so much of it is affected by the behavior of the people who live there, right? So even that perfect house, if there's five people versus two or three dogs instead of a cat, it does change the indoor air quality and how much energy is consumed. And what I'm excited about with that internet of things, I don't think that it's the silver bullet, but I do think that to whatever extent it can automate some of those controls and just take that off of the plate of the people that live there, then I think that's going to be beneficial. There's so much about how you quote unquote drive your home that's got to do with what happens inside it, of course, the energy usage, the maintenance issues, and the air quality altogether. Well, this has been a fun conversation feel like I'm getting to know you better. And that's a good thing too. <laughs> like having fun. <laughs> good. I like having friends in fun outdoorsy places like Montana. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, you're certainly welcome to come anytime. I get excited about this stuff and I, it is encouraging to meet people like you and Chris and to know that there's guys like Nate Adams and Corbett Lunsford and let's say Matt Reisinger. I mean, there are sort of these quote unquote, superstars that are getting some press. People are paying attention. They're producing quality information and media and getting the message out there. And I really appreciate that those guys are out there. Those, it gives me hope that I won't always be the grumpy inspector who's <laughs> complaining about all this work that's being done. And I don't always want to be that way. So, <laughs> And one other thing I'll say is all those people you mentioned, 
I know them personally. You know a lot of them personally. They're all normal people. They're all very approachable. They're just regular human beings. So that's what's great about this market so far is I haven't really found, I found everybody has got this warmth and a real individual uniqueness and personality. Well, and I think everybody's trying to work towards something better for everybody. When I talk to contractors and I say, if you do this, you won't have those callbacks later, those comfort issues. You won't have to worry about whether there's going to be mold growing and you're going to have to call the restoration guys out for three grand. I mean, there's a ton of benefit that it's not just for the homeowner and it's not just for the planet or whatever. It's everybody who is a stakeholder has something to gain and benefit from by building a better product. And so whatever niche we're in, we're able to affect change just by talking about it, making it visible and making it known. And why well, I'm happy you're doing this podcast and you invited me on. Thank you. If anyone listening wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way? Gosh, I suppose email or text. Like I said, I guess I'm old enough that I'm not a cool social media guy. I don't get it. So if you ask me to like send a tweet right now, I'd, I've never in my life sent a tweet, which I probably should. I don't know. I hear there's some funny stuff that comes out of the office, but I guess I'm old school. I have email or text at james at redpointmontana.com. Shoot me up. I'd be happy to chat more about it. If anybody's got any ideas on how to get these guys to giddy up here in Montana, you let me know. That's what it's all about. Thank you so much for spending the time with me today, James. I uh, really appreciate it. And let's look forward to what this podcast can do, this conversation here can do. I have a good feeling we're going to get some good feedback and we're going to stop waiting for the world to change. We're going to make the world change. How's that? <laughs> I like it. I like it, Bill. Thanks so much for having me on. Thank you, James. Take care. Thank you for listening to this episode. We hope you learned something from it and enjoyed the discussion that I got to have with James Childry. You can find other trade-related podcasts in the Blue Collar Roots Network by going to bluecollarroots.com, where we're doing our part to help transform and professionalize the trades by filling the skills gap through training and communication. If you like what you heard today and not subscribed to the podcast, you might want to consider following us on Facebook, type in Building HVAC Science, or subscribing to the podcast and any of the typical podcast services by searching for Building HVAC Science. And this quote is by Napoleon Hill. Patience, persistence, and perspiration make an unbeatable combination for success. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor of the Building HVAC Science podcast, please reach out to me at bill at bluecollarroots.com. If you're in the market for some of the tools or test instruments that we mention in our podcast, take a look at what True Tech Tools has to offer. That's T-R-U-T-E-C-H-T-O-O-L-S dot com. And use the code HVACBS, that's HVACBS, for a nice discount. And full disclosure, I'm a co-owner at TrueTech. I want to thank you for listening. Again, please subscribe. And we look forward to having you back on the next edition of the Building HVAC Science Podcast. Have a good day. <music>